am so thrilled for my next guest. He is bomb, like amazing actor, comedic actor, dramatic actor. Uh, he's been on the November Man, Californication, Fat Actress, HMO. I mean, the list is so long. Um, let's talk to him. Why don't we find out about everything, all things Bill Smitrovich. Hi there. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> hey. How's everybody? Uh, they're all saying hello. Oh, yeah. I, I do want to say to, hello to everybody that uh, is actually watching. Uh, Facebook fans and Instagram fans and Twitter fans and friends and, and some family. And I will send out a special hello to my sister, Vicky, who I'm sure is watching at Connecticut. And love you, sis. And hang in there. Oh, you yeah. are so sweetheart. You are so sweet. Well, Thanks. I, I just state the obvious. Um, <laughs> <that's my job. laughs> well, you, but in a funny way. <laughs> yeah, <sometimes. laughs> Very sexy too, as Marilyn. You yeah, should have left the, the birthmark on, darling. Oh, I deleted it. I was oh. like, oh yeah, because it was it was weird. It was like a a black dot. <laughs> it wasn't even a mole. I was like, this feels like somebody just went and poked me with a pencil or something. It was weird. Yeah, you kind of go to the screen and go, hey, can I get that off here? What's exactly. It? That's what I was thinking because I did a bunch of stories on Facebook and right. I'm like. I was even like, oh, oh wait, that's the mole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got them too. I, I can't really share it. We're know, not going to share moles. <laughs> Listen, I got moles, but not in the right place for Marilyn. So mm. I know, right? <laughs> My luck. Uh, but, you know, I always start with the very, very beginning, okay? Because there's a lot of actors and comedians and everybody that's in the entertainment business is watching and they're looking forward to hearing about your career and you giving them advice. So we'll start from the very beginning. So um, I know that you started in the theater. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you started acting? Well, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm uh, very lucky. And uh, I'm a very lucky individual to to discover what uh, was inside of me, and I didn't know, and I was lucky enough to uh, be in the right place at the right time sometimes. And sometimes you get what you deserve in this business, and sometimes you deserve what you get. <laughs> Ooh, that's very so, fun. <laughs> yeah. So you you know, uh, for me. I was always, you know, it, I think it starts with just moving around a lot when I was a kid. And you'll find that a lot of actors have that share that same M.O. You know, uh, many of us uh, were uh, army brats or moved around quite a bit. And, uh, you know, we end up uh, getting really good at kind of observe observational skills and look around to see what's happening and kind of suss things out, you know. So I did a lot of that, but um, it, it's just how it happened. My, my dad died when I was 17, and I oh. didn't know what I was going to do. So I uh, was a really good bowler. <laughs> how about that? Actually, uh, when I lived in California, I was on the San Diego, uh, San Diego, I was a San Diego junior match game champion at 15, and I was on the Southern California All-Star team at 15. <laughs> In bowling, wow, right? Look at you. So we we go to California. We go to Connecticut, and um, I am uh, uh, I'm this wonderkin because I nobody can bowl ten pin. Everybody's bowling duck pin. So I know this is far from the acting thing, right? But after my dad died, I I was a really good bowler. I hooked up with this guy, and he was a real good pool player. And he and I kind of hustled our way across country for about a month. And uh, I came back sort of with the tail between my legs and, and then uh, went to work. And after two years, I decided to go to college. Now that put me at around 21. And then about 24 or 25, I got involved in the theater department at the uh, University of Bridgeport. And uh, somebody said, well, you know, you're kind of funny. Why don't you go and audition for Lenny? And I thought they were talking about Lenny Bruce, the play. Yeah. And uh, and so I went down there and they handed me of mice and men for the role of Lenny. 
And uh, I'd never read Mice and Men. I'd never read any Steinbeck. I was really not a great uh, literate guy at that time. I didn't, I wasn't into it, but I was special. I, I was uh, minoring in special education. And when I read Of Mice and Men for the first time, it, it blew my mind. Um, it was like this epiphany that I had for this character and I knew so much about him. And I felt like, oh my God, I, this is, you know, the, this is incredible. He just started to wash over me because I knew I had to go in and do the thing, right? So I read it. It's the first time I'd ever wept at a piece of literature in my life. Wow. It moved me incredibly so. And uh, I went into the audition and I started to get into Lenny and I'm doing the scene where he breaks uh, uh, Curly's wife's neck while she's trying to seduce him and he's thinks he's brushing her hair and he gets carried away and and I'm into the scene and and uh, all of a sudden I hear the laughing and I stopped and I looked at the director and I said, you're laughing? I said, how can you be laughing? This is the most beautiful human being that I've ever, you know, and I just got so upset, you know, and I said, why are you laughing? If you're laughing, you shouldn't be directing this play. And I, 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 I'm talking to this guest director. I don't know who this guy is, but I was fired up. And I said, hey, you know, and he said, no, we're not laughing at you. We're laughing with you because we just found our Lenny. Oh, I love that. And oh, my gosh. was oh, like my whole mind. I mean, I was just, it was a whole new world. And Alpia, who was the director of that play, uh, God bless his soul. He was a wonderful uh, a man who had a, a theater in Stamford, Connecticut called the Sterling Barn Theater. And it's where I met another great Morris Karnofsky and his wife, Phoebe Brand, where uh, we took the show to their theater. And uh, Al taught me so much in such a little time uh, about acting, about the beats of a play, how to break down a character, uh, what a scene is and how it becomes a scene and and uh, taught me about blocking and um, so much, so much so. And uh, just let me be, just let me be who, who I was bringing to this character. And uh, it, was, uh, it was an incredibly emotional experience and incredibly gratifying. Uh, I can't thank the people enough around me, who I'm still in touch with, by the way, who were there as members of the theater department who were so supportive of me because uh, I was uh, I was an outlier, you know. Wow. Uh, but they ended up giving me the Best Actor Award that year. And uh, and it was it was the beginning of the beginning. Uh, I met Morris. And then uh, after graduation in 1972, I went off, uh, uh, found out about uh, a graduate program at Smith College in 1974. And uh, they gave me a free ride, tuition, and a stipend for two years to get my master's in theater. And uh, Lenny was one of the uh, roles I used for the audition. Oh, so, sure. <laughs> uh, it helped me get uh, uh, a, a great education and uh, some incredible mentoring from people that uh, were just astounding in my life. Uh, uh, you know, I met Maya Angelou when I was there, and I met my I I, I named my daughter after her. Uh, when I vowed after meeting her, I said I will name my firstborn female child after you, and uh, so cool. we ended up adopting our second child and naming her Maya. And uh, it was uh, I mailed her some of her children's books and with a letter telling her that I'd named my child after her. And she actually wrote me back and inscribed the books and flourishing autograph and notes to my daughter. Wow. Just so oh, special. That is so special. Yeah, it really was. It really was. I love it. So your first connection was emotional, you know, with a character. Do oh, you God. always obviously. Uh, so you all, do you always connect whenever you read um, for an, 
a character or whatever you're studying a character, do you uh, connect first emotionally? Does that happen naturally? Or do you um, do something to connect to that character? Well, uh, as I was told long ago, you know, uh, Morris Karnofsky said, if I'm going to give you any advice, it's read, read, and read. Uh, so when you read, uh, you get a script and you start to read it and you don't know what it is. You keep turning the page. You don't know what it is. So you just let it wash over you. And you, the most important thing for me as an actor, when I'm reading a script, is there a story here? Uh, what is the story? How do I fit into the story? Um, does my character, you know, if it's a supporting character, how do I just support this character? And how do I support the story uh, of this character and the story of the film or the play or whatever it may be? Um, and then you get into uh, the, the nuts and bolts of, of the character and why they are how they are. And I try to love my characters because no – Nobody thinks they're wrong. So, you know, you're, you, you don't judge a character. Uh, you live the character. You, you discover, you experiment. You, you know, it's like the onion. You peel it away until you get to it. And, um, you know, there's so many things you, you can and do and not should do, but uh, just open yourself up to the possibilities of this character, but you know, you have to stay within the framework of the story. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so you, yeah, you know, you're. It you're serves the story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I know that you were very passionate about a film that you did uh, uh, with Pierce Brosnan, The November Man, which I did watch. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> no <Wait>. spoilers. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> I loved it. So, oh, good. Can you talk a little bit more about that experience? Well, it was the best film experience of my life. And, uh, and partly to do with, uh, with Pierce and partly to do with where we were in the world. And, and uh, this character was intriguing um, for a lot of reasons. But, you know, to get back to Pierce, I mean, we started the movie May 16th. The filming was on May 16th, which is both of our birthdays. Oh, come on, really? Yeah. So uh, when I got to the office, there was a birthday cake there. <laughs> oh my God, out of there. This is so nice. They're going to have a birthday cake for me. That is so cool. Well, it turned out to be Pierce's and we, uh, we both had the cake and we went out that night and, and uh, we hit it off pretty good. I mean, you know, it, considering and, um, we would we'd go out most nights and we had uh, we just had a, a, a good time throwing the ball back and forth with these two characters. And um, um, and Pierce is such a gentleman and uh, such a great supportive co-star. And I mean, co-star, I mean, it was uh, uh, he is uh, gracious and um, giving and. Uh, we we had a good time. I mean, uh, after it was over, uh, we went, I've been a party to his house, which was just grand, and lives on the beach in Malibu. You know, it's of very, course. <laughs> but uh, he's uh, he's quite a guy, and uh, to carry all of the sorrow he's had in his life uh, with the deaths of his family. In fact, let me just tell you one poignant story. His um, his daughter died while we were filming. Oh my God. And she had been sick for a very long time with the same cancer that killed her mother. Well, yeah. Oh. And uh, so Pierce would, you know, he had his mother came to see us. Uh, mother May, she came from England, which is great, but they had just returned from uh, his sister's deathbed. And, uh, and it's a good thing Pierce went. He, he told me this, you know, he, they actually had, she wanted to be married before she died. Oh, and my God. They, uh, they had a wedding ceremony uh, there at the hospital. And uh, she had children 
with her husband. And um, it's incredible how compartmentalized actors have to have their lives. And that's another a piece of advice I'd give to any actor is uh, uh, you have to have a emotional armor. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. Along with vulnerability, you have to have the armor to protect your soul, your heart. Mm -hmm. And because uh, um, a lot of things are going to come at you during your time and uh, just, you know, keep remaining positive and open and creative and mm -hmm. giving, you know, giving is the best way to be creative. Absolutely. And there's, as, as a stand-up comic, uh, you know, I figured out that I want to give my energy, but I have to be careful what energy I allow into my energy field. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of what you're saying to com you know, compartmental. I can't pronounce it. I'm Latino. Compartmentalize. You know, you, you know, <laughs> yeah. men are better at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why I, I was uh, told today that I have big dick energy, uh, apparently. So, yeah. <laughs> Compart okay, say the word for me again. Compartmentalize. Okay. I will, you know, I, I, that and February. I can't say the word. <laughs> uh, everything else. Yeah, I'm I'm good. Good. <laughs> I'm good. Uh, so, how, how did you um, learn or, or train yourself to? Um, have to your compartments i can't freaking say uh, <laughs> you know like the way i'm describing like well you know it's funny that's a good question that's a good yeah. question because um i think a lot of actors and actors uh actresses when they're working when they have a survival job it's usually a bartender or a waiter right yeah so you have to compartmentalize your life on the floor or behind the bar you know you you can't you have to keep seven different things going at the same time, but still go, Hey, how you doing? Everything. All right. Okay. You know, it's like, it's, but in your head, when you're an actor, your head is going like, like this mm -hmm. and you have to stay. Yeah. Like that. Mm -hmm. Stillness is the most powerful thing and people don't get it, mm -hmm. to just shut up and be quiet. <laughs> and listen to others and listen to you, to yourself. That's right. I think a lot of people are scared to listen to themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. listen with themselves. Yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm very interested. You know, if I'm running, talking to somebody, and they're just a little, you know, hey, come on, just keep talking. I just oh. want to see how really stupid you really are. Yeah. <laughs> And then or funny, or funny how you are, you know. Yeah, because you draw from your experiences too. Like, do you bring um, whenever you you're in, you know, studying a character? Or do you remember like somebody? Oh, I remember this person. I can like borrow oh. some mannerisms or some, you know. Oh, so most definitely. Oh God, I had a guy. <laughs> I can't wait to use this in a in a movie. Um, I was I was in graduate school. I was at Deerfield uh, Inn at the Deerfield Academy in Massachusetts. I was working as a waiter and a bartender. And uh, we had a general manager there. But my friend Phil told me, oh, there's a job there. Just, you know, go to the general manager. And you, when you talk to him, his name is, uh, I think his name was Steve. You go up to Steve, but he's going to do something. But don't, I'm not going to tell you what it is, because but don't react. Just don't react. It's just a thing that he does. So, okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, I meet Steve and I say, hi, Steve. It's nice to meet you. Yes, it's nice to meet you here at the Deerfield Inn. And we do breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And uh, we get up in the early morning so you can, you know, when you when you set the table for breakfast, you he would put down the forks and knives in a certain way, you know, but he would go, hmm, I can't even do it now, but it was way up here in his nose somewhere. And he would, hmm, and he didn't know he was doing it. He didn't so, know? No, no. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it 
just, just involuntary. I can't do it right now. My my throat is dry. There. I, not, is it dry now? No, not anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> no, but anyway, there are, oh my God, yeah, there's um, walks that you remember and uh, accents that you remember and uh, geez, just how people, you know, the rhythms of their voices. And, you know, when I, uh, I was in graduate school, I, one of my favorite, I love to do Chekhov and, and the, uh, one of the greatest books that I've read was by Michael Chekhov, who is the nephew of Anton Chekhov. Oh. And he wrote the book called to the actor. And, uh, Every chapter started with a quote. And this one particular chapter started with a quote that I'll never forget. It was from a critic in London in 1910, I think. It says, all art aspires to the condition of music. When you think of how, and when I thought back of how Al taught me to play, play was broken down into beats the scene had a certain rhythm they were all musical uh, words that expressed exactly what was what was going on or gave you a feeling of it and when you think of uh, geez the what music can do to you you know what, how it can stir your soul, and and not only the not only the uh, the sounds, but how it sounds. That's why you talk about iambic pentameter in Shakespeare. It's all done with a rhythm. That's right. So it's that meant a lot to me. So every time I look at uh, a script or some words, I'm looking for ways to say a line or ways not to say a lot. So I, I draw on a musical element of that every now and then. I, you know, Or I'll put on a piece of music and see how different I feel uh, doing that while that music is on rather than I would if, I, say, Wagner was on or something, you know, mm -hmm. something somber. But uh, so music is an incredible uh, part of all our lives. And uh, it's so... Um, universal. Universal. Yeah. I was the say. drum beats. Yeah. I saw a beautiful movie last night. If everybody wants to see it, The Sound of Metal. The Sound of Metal. The Sound of Metal. It's about a it's about a rocker drummer who loses his hearing. Wow! What a premise. Incredible. And this actor and the actress who plays his girl. Uh, is great. I mean, they're out there just like, you know, CBGB time, you know, and he gets his like this and, and it got this wonderful actor that played the role. And uh, <laughs> he said some things in an interview. I heard him say that uh, I can't sleep before the first day of filming. And uh, that's, true. <laughs> that's true. I couldn't do that. November, man, I was the same way. I stayed up all night. I, I, oh, really? I had a four-page scene that started the movie. Uh, yeah, I, that, that was, I, yeah, that's true. I was terrified. <laughs> and I sat out there in that beautiful thing. I, you know, it's just, ah. Uh, that's a that lot. Beautiful setting. And, you know, it was the air conditioning wouldn't work. And then, oh, no. you know, it's this beautiful little room I had, but it was hot. And I, oh, God, it's crazy. But anyway, Montenegro was the trip of a lifetime. It and looked then so after, beautiful. Oh, oh my um, God. I was like, I want to go there. Mm. Well, well, the Russians are buying it up. You better get there soon. <laughs> top, top. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, you know, after the movie, uh, I'll, I'll stop here. But after the movie, uh, we, my wife and I went on a Croatian 10-day vacation. And we drove over 1,000 kilometers all over Croatia and we okay. stayed at national parks and uh, bed and breakfasts and all kinds of things. You know, it was, we just had a marvelous time, you know. And, uh, That's great. And I heard that you did your, your own stunts. Is that, is that, that, do you did your own stunts? I didn't have that many stunts. 
Oh, you well, but still, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, it was through it. <laughs> I was. A, I was a little younger then. That was a few years ago. So I'm 73 now, but I don't feel a day over 68. <laughs> well, you don't look at it. <laughs> but you, you did your own stunts. Would you recommend actors to do their own stunts, or is it you can? Well, get you know, every actor wants to do their own stunt if they can do it. Yeah. You know, but. I've learned that sometimes it's better just to let the step out and let the stunt guy do it. I, uh, I would think so. Oh yeah. And yeah. I learned that. Uh, uh, Jimmy Nickerson, uh, a stunt man who just passed away. God bless his soul. And I know there's some people out there who know Jimmy and uh, he was a wild man. Oh. Uh, played for the Oakland Raiders, <laughs> but, uh, and a lot of, just a great guy. But, um, he was doubling me when I was doing crime story. And uh, Oh, well, that's a great segue because we have a couple of people that want to know about crime story. Um, Dave is like, Bill, please talk about crime story and Ted. We'll leave Ted for later. We're going to oh, do the okay. later. And Frank here, uh, could you ask if he knows what would have happened on crime story if it had been made for a third season? It ended with their plane crashing in the ocean, and we never find out the fate of anyone. And he was my favorite character. Oh, thanks, thanks, Frank. Uh, yeah, we all wanted it, didn't want it to end, and a lot of us didn't want to go to Vegas. A lot of us just wanted to stay in Chicago, actually. Um, but we did. That's where my son was born, conceived in Chicago, born in Las Vegas. Just a great, it's a great kid. Wow. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but, um, we, uh, it was a great, you know, Michael Mann, uh, I owe my, my film and TV start to Michael Mann. I mean, I started in TV with Michael Mann and Miami Vice. I was in the pilot and Sonny Crockett's ex bad partner. But then Michael Mann, uh, when we were doing, um, Manhunter, uh, a movie with Bill Peterson, and Dennis and I and Bill were in a lot of scenes together. And one day I'm standing near the camera and Michael says to me, how would you like to be in a TV show? <laughs> With you? Uh, no, you and Dennis. Well, sure. What is it? It's a cop show. I'll, I'll let you know later. <laughs> but uh, Chuck Adamson, Dennis's partner, Mm -hmm. in the major crime unit at the time, because Dennis was a real cop for 13 years. And uh, Chuck wrote and created the series. And uh, everybody had a counterpart, except for me. Uh, uh, Clemens had a counterpart. Uh, uh, Steve Ryan had a counterpart. Uh, Billy uh, Campbell had a counterpart. And other guys that were Bill, Paul Butler had a counterpart with a guy who always had a cigar and like this, you know, and he was always had holes in his teeth in his ties from a cigar. going down. But these guys were tough guys. These guys would go into most any neighborhood in Chicago and take care of business. Damn. And uh, Dennis was, was just so kind to me. Uh, he showed me the cops bar where the guy came in, didn't know it was a cops bar and tried to hold it up. <laughs> and all the, all the all the guys in the bar were cops, and they all pulled out their guns and they just pointed to this guy. <laughs> True story. It's in the it's in the movie Heat. It's in my it's in Michael Mann's movie The Heat. Anyway, uh, crime story, cry check. Um, well, so let me let me give you some feedback here, Vivica. Hi, Vivica. Great. Hey, Vivica. Hi, Vivica. A a strong, courageous, incredibly. Beautiful. Yeah. She's yeah. Beautiful. Unbelievable. Kid. She's she's beat it. Yes. I love you, Vivica. But uh, you know, the crime story was uh, was just a real, mm -hmm. just a lot of fun, man. We had so much fun, and <laughs> so much fun, and so many wonderful guest stars. Who I mean. We had Miles Davis who let me hold his trumpet. And, oh my God. Hey, man, you want to you hold it? Oh, yeah, can I? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, Lynette McKee and Pamela Greer and Kevin Spacey and uh, 
uh, Paul Anka. I mean, it went on and on. We just, they just loved coming on their show. And uh, it was, it was just a wonderful time uh, in, in the eighties, especially, you know, we just had a great time and Vegas was, was ours. You know, we, during those days and we could go to any golf course and just get on. I loved it. <laughs> nice. Well, here's Veronica. Hi, Veronica. She says, she says, I'd like to know what is one of Bill's favorite roles he's ever played and why? Mm. Well, uh, I was doing a play in Williamstown Theater Festival around 2000 or so. And it was called The Skin of Our Teeth and uh, written by Thornton Wilder. It's a, a classic three act play um, about the beginning and the end of the world. And uh, it's quite remarkable. We had Christine Nielsen, Kaylee Roca, uh, you know, Jimmy Simpson, who became a big hit in, uh, in HBO land. And uh, another guy, uh, uh, Polish name became a big hit on Newsroom. He was uh, my son. And uh, this is many years ago. And it's a wonderful apprentice program they have there at Williamstown. So anyway, we do this beautiful three-act play, which is just, God, people paid with their food vouchers to see this play oh my in, God. during World War II. Wow. It was so important for them. And one of the wonderful lines of this play is, always beginning again, over and over, Ooh. beginning again. And that's, that's life. That's life, I was just, yeah. That's, that's the world, always beginning again, over and over, over, beginning again. So we did this beautiful play. I, had, and it, I came down with a little bit of a throat thing and I was using the, the K, 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 I'm blowing up my, my nose and the, trying to wash out my nasal passages. And uh, so we get to the final uh, show, uh, eight performances a week, three act play, uh, two on Friday, two on Sunday. So we do the final show on Sunday. And I decided to stay in my dressing room just for like 20 minutes, 25 minutes, just to let the crowd leave, you know, and because uh, I just wanted to go home and go to bed. I didn't know what kind of crowd we had that night. But <laughs> I opened my door. And the whole experience was just wonderful. And the man that directed that play was Darko Tresniak, who was the Yugoslavian man that I told you about in Love, Suicide at Schofield Barracks back in People's Light and Theater Company. Oh, so how about that? You're full circle. Full, totally. Yes. Now I open my door and there's Paul Newman, arms akimbo, tears in his eyes, arms open. And he gives me a hug that I will never forget for the rest of my life. And Joanne Woodwards comes prancing over and she says, Isn't he just like Freddie, Paul? Isn't he just like Freddie? And she was remarking because they had seen the original production with Frederick March mm. and Tallulah Bankhead and Van Patten, actually. The older Van Patten was the telegram boy in that production. And uh, Sarah Thompson was the wife. But that was just, that was like the moon to me. I mean, to have two of my idols, one in the ether and one in my arms at the same time was just a remarkable experience. I love it. Love that story. <laughs> Thanks. And here's my uh, friend Marcia. What an intellectual. Very sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to throw that. <laughs> Thanks, Marcia. But I can get really goofy at times, too. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to your comedic roles. Oh, my yeah. God. You are Hilarious. Oh, thank you. Oh, my thank God. You. I, I wanted to be funny. <laughs> you are so funny. Um, thank you. I loved this. You're high. <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> I don't know for what, but yeah, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> and 
No, for making for making love on the produce in the back room. You're hired. <laughs> oh, well, I've been there. <laughs> I can do that with, uh, with my eyes closed, literally. Uh, that was the Ted segue. <laughs> oh, Ted. Well, let's talk about Ted because. Oh, you know, I just did. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that experience because I know that, let me look for the comment. I know my friend Dave, hi Dave. He wanted to know a little bit more about uh, your experience um, with Ted. Ted. Uh, I had a great time. And that was, uh, never expected it to go to Ted too. Never expected to be in Ted too. <laughs> but uh, Seth said to me, in fact, at the audition, I'll tell you two stories with Seth. Uh, who has a fabulous house, by the way. Mm. It's like a 60-piece orchestra at the rap party and the singing, unbelievable. Yeah. So uh, we, uh, I go into audition and, you know, I'm doing the scene where, uh, you know, I, I, I know that, you know, Ted's the one, he's, now they talk about supporting. Ted is the, he's the funny one. Yeah. Frank's not funny. Frank's not supposed to be funny. So, I knew that I just had to play the straight guy. Right. So I went in and played the straight guy and, uh, and Seth hit me with all kinds of ad, ad lib lines and I stayed right in character and I stayed really straight and uh, we stopped and he just laughed out loud and said, okay, thanks a lot. Jeez. Thanks a lot. And uh, I walk out and I'm walking down the hallway and the casting director comes running after me. She goes, Oh, Bill, Bill, can you come back in? Seth just wants to, um, just wants to tell you one thing. Uh, he wants to talk to you one more time. I said, okay, all right. So we go back in. He said, Bill, I just want to tell you, if I had a contract right now, I'd have you sign it. Wow. <laughs> so I kind of knew the part was mine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, we, uh, let me see the other one. Um, oh, uh, I uh, you know, when we started doing Ted 2, uh, Seth comes over to me. He, goes, he says, you know, I, I couldn't keep you out of this picture. I said, what are you talking about? He says, the reaction people got on your line was, was through the roof. So I couldn't keep you out. So they had to write me in just based on one line or That's a couple of lines or whatever, you know. But I, I, uh, I loved it. I thought I had a great time. And Seth is... Uh, He's genius. He's he yeah. really is a genius, and he's got a great group of people around him that make that Ted uh, thing so incredibly real. Uh, the the technology that goes on while you're filming is incredible. Can you can you tell us a little bit more about that? How, how well you have to look at a spot where you think he might be, and then right. you do it over again, and then you repeat everything, and then they 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 kind of move him into that spot. And they have a teddy bear. They have a Ted looking like bear that they put there. But then they'll replace him with okay. the green screen or whatever that is. But it's very clever. They do, they do it. Uh, I don't know how they do it. I mean, it's just intellectually and technically way over my head. Wow. So but it's fascinating. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, so what was your favorite comedic role of all time? Like your absolute top favorite? <laughs> we'll give you time. <laughs> well, uh, you probably had a lot, I'm sure. Well, no, there are, there are a few, but Crazy People, when I was doing Crazy People, this was about 30 years ago, and... Uh, I was so free, you know, I felt so free. I was in an insane asylum. The, 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 uh, the, the costume designer gave me what I wanted was just mattress ticking to wear as a, as a jacket. You know, I was just, I was Bruce and I just love being Bruce. So, um, and um, John Malkovich was in the lead with Daryl Hannah when we started. And Mitch Markowitz, who was the writer of the movie and also the writer of Good Morning Vietnam, uh, was directing the film. And that was the that was the, uh, the agreement they had that he would write it, but he'd had to direct it. And he wanted John Malkovich in the lead. Mm -hmm. OK. We start three weeks of filming. 
They fired John Malkovich. They fired Mitch Markowitz. And they kept all this ensemble of crazy people, one of whom was uh, John Kuzak's father. Oh, wow. Okay. You're right. And uh, they kept us there for a week, paid us, our families, everything. We were there in Virginia. And then they said, we're starting up again. And we're bringing in Dudley Moore to replace Malkovich. And Tony Bill is going to direct. Now, Tony and Dudley were friends. Mm -hmm. And Dudley, when he came on the set, it was like somebody opened the curtains and the sunshine came in. It was amazingly funny. The man is so amazingly funny, so giving, can play the piano like you cannot believe. And he had a special relationship with each one of us in about a week. And unfortunately, John was going through some love problems mm -hmm. with Michelle Pfeiffer at the time. And... It's always a woman. <laughs> it, was, it was affecting his performance. <laughs> well, that's women got us here. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, but, you know, that uh, crazy people uh, was a lot of fun. But I got to say, you know, nothing like getting a laugh when you're doing live theater. Uh, you know, you can't go to every performance of your film. But you can't go to every performance of your play. <laughs> so you do hear the laughs and uh you know they're uh it's it's it, it keeps you young. You well know, yeah, the that more laughs you hear. Yeah, that exchange of energy. It's like doing stand up. You have that exchange of energy that yeah, that just it's so amazing. It when it, when it works. <laughs> but stand up is a little bit more, you know, uh but yeah, when it works, it's just delicious. It's just yes, it is. You're high for like a long time. You can't. But yeah, you can't I'll tell you a funny uh, theater story about laugh. Uh, uh, and you might have heard this one before. Um, uh, let me think. Uh, uh, the Lunts, uh, Lynn Fontaine and Alfred Lunt, were two uh, prestigious, very. Uh, celebrated theater actors of the day. And uh, they, uh, John Lithgow told me the story when we were doing Requiem for Heavyweight in, in, in a theater in New Haven. And uh, he said, uh, Alfred turned to, uh, to, to his wife and he said, darling, I just can't, I just can't bear it. I, I've gotten a laugh on that line when I asked for a cup of tea it gave a big laugh. And I'm not getting the laugh anymore when I asked for a cup of tea. And she turned to him and said, darling, you're asking for a laugh, not a cup of tea. Oh my God, that is so, <laughs> absolutely. Isn't that yes. wonderful? Oh, that summarizes it. What a beautiful way to illustrate that right. point. That's Don't right. Don't go for it. It'll come to you. Just be who you have to be. That's right. That's all you have to do. Thank you. Yes. Give people some room. Give them some room. Absolutely. Yes. You give them room. You give yourself room. Just yeah. be. Do what you have to do, and the laughs will come to you. The more confident you are, the more confident the audience is. Absolutely. If you're having fun, also, like I said, stand up. It's the same thing. If you're having fun, they're having fun, too. That's right. That's yeah, right. so it's it's really simple. I love that. I love. Oh my god, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I love also about you? I love your positive attitude and your positive outlook. And I wanted to ask you, how do you think that has helped you, not only in your life but in your art? Well, you can't. You you don't get anywhere in show business without a positive attitude. <laughs> True. Uh, I learned that, uh, yeah. and that's a that's a learned. Thing I didn't always have a positive attitude. Um, uh, I don't really. In the last few months, I haven't had a positive attitude, um, and um, 
we've, you know, we've had some difficulties in our lives and uh, it's not all uh, peaches and cream all the time. And uh, a lot of people um, base their opinions of actors and actresses on the, the behavior of one actor or one actress or a group of actors or whatever, you know, we're all people, we're all different. Uh, yeah, we're real people too. Actors are real people. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just you're more public than other professions. Right, and you know, yeah. I you it, you have to be positive to get anything done in this world, especially yeah. in the movie business. Uh, it's amazing. It's like you've heard it a thousand times. It's amazing anything gets done in Hollywood. Yeah, uh, it's got to go through so many things, but. Um, there's nothing wrong with being positive, but, and there's nothing, you can be positive, but don't be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah, don't, don't be a fool. Exactly. Uh, but during this COVID lockdown, I want, I'm curious to find out, did you, because uh, we had a little talk the other day, did you, find? Uh, what did you discover about yourself during this lockdown? Hmm. Well, I had surgery. Um, I had a uh, surgery on my ankle and uh, that took care of about three months of it. Uh, so, so I can't say that, but we've been in the house. We don't, you know, we don't go out a lot. Uh, very rarely do we go out. We went out, yes, uh, we went out this morning to get our shot. Um, oh. No, yesterday to get our shot at Dodger Stadium. But that's the first time we've been out for months. Uh, go out, take my car out every now and then, we take a walk. But uh, what I've learned uh, is that this country needs to have a to have a conversation with itself mm -hmm. to so we can communicate. Americans can communicate with Americans. Uh, we're not all that we see on television. It's a big country and we're all connected by the internet. We're all connected by phones and uh, platforms, social media platforms, all kinds of things. And we have to find a way to make that you make, make use of that to our advantage, not to our disadvantage, but to use technology in a way that's going to inform, communicate. People can tell the truth, learn about what's new, what's being invented, what has happened in places you don't even know about, uh, that people turn a blind eye to so many problems in this country based on, unfortunately, their own selfish needs. Um, we're a country of Americans country of immigrants that we need to um, come together. That's what makes us so great is that we are a quilted country, mm -hmm. it's like an AIDS quilt. I mean, come on, we've all got to pull together. We all need one another. Yeah. Uh, so it's, I think, you know, uh, right now it's a confusing time in people's lives. And this last year has been just really hard on everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need uh, need to open our hearts and maybe listen to some advice from people that um, are proficient in this area. You know, mental health people, psychologists, uh, sociologists, you know, to learn about what we have learned from this. Look at what we've done by being COVID. Look at, look at all the destruction and the the avarice, uh, the division, it's horrible. And uh, now we have a chance, I think, um, mm -hmm. to, not because it's a Democrat or Republican. I, I, I don't want to do that. I just want to say you know, we're all really people. Bad. Yeah. We're all people. If we yeah. weren't separated by Democrat and Republican, we'd be all people. Yeah. And right now there's a person that is more interested in all the people. Okay. rather than just some of the people. 
thinking that those some of the people are going to take care of all the rest of the people. Well, I'm not so sure that works that way. But I know this, but I know that American people, when they get behind something, Katie, bar the door. When they say they're going to come together, we come together. And this is a war we need to fight mm -hmm. together, not only of COVID, but this war of division, mm -hmm. this war of hate. And uh, we need to, put, uh, need to put a big wet towel on it. I agree completely. I, uh, I'm from Argentina. You know, I was telling you I grew up in a military dictatorship and I moved to America because of what you're talking about. Like once you guys get behind something, I was like, I feel like the beautiful American spirit. And that's why I moved here. And now I'm like, when did I move here? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm back in Argentina. <coughs> what? I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it feels well, like it. It's been bubbling underneath, you know, a long time, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, you, everybody has one vote. We at least have one vote. You know, some votes, some votes have bigger mouths than other votes, yeah. but you still get one vote. <laughs> everybody. Now, unfortunately, buildings and businesses get one vote, which is crazy. I don't know. I haven't run in a building that I could talk to. A corporation that I could actually say, you know, what do you think about these policies? Uh, no, I haven't run into that yet. Anyway, <clears throat> so I don't know. It's a crazy it. mixed up world, and we're, we I wish we to. could all see one another as our neighbor um, yeah. and treat them as we would like to be treated. Uh, and yeah. That's as simple as that. Absolutely. We need healing for sure. Absolutely. I'm going to go into some deeper questions because uh, you're such a deep person. I, I love that about you. Um, yeah. I, I just, when I, I researched you also besides knowing you and I, you know, I researched my guests and everything and I was watching your conversations with, you know, interviews and stuff. I was like, Oh my God, I love this guy. So <laughs> honey, <laughs> you are not safe. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Okay, so I know I can ask you this question and uh, you'll have an answer for it. So what do you feel is your mission on this earth? Well, that's pretty, you know, when I discovered acting, my mission was to uh, display the human condition. Oh, I love that. And that's what, that's what we all do. That's what actors do who know what they're doing and uh, who, who have an idea of it anyway. But that's what we're doing right now is uh, this human condition that we're in is, and it's like Thornton said, you know, beginning again, always beginning again, over and over and over. Beginning. Yeah. That's what it's all about. I had a, a friend of mine who has two young kids and he was like, Oh, what am I going to do? This world is it's like, no, just, it's going to be different. Yeah. It's, it's a new world. Yes. It's different. And that's not worse or better. It's just different. Right. And, it's starting again. It's change, and we need change. Uh, right. What would you son. like to be known for? Hmm. I'm not done yet. But, you know, one of the most gratifying jobs I've ever had was Life Goes On. And, uh, That was, uh, that was a game changer uh, for a lot of people. And life goes on to me will always be uh, one of the most gratifying jobs I've ever had in this business. Um, part of the reason is because I minored in special education and uh, part of it is because of, of all the incredible fans and letters that we got. Um, uh, I would get letters from siblings, which were really incredible, but saying that I never knew my mother, and I never knew my brother or sister was capable of anything like that. And it opened up eyes and hearts and souls. And um, Chris is, uh, I, I, I just uh, talked to Chris last August for his birthday. He's uh, 50 something. <laughs> and, uh, we all got on the Zoom call with uh, the crew and Kelly and Chris and uh, 
a lot of the, you know, the DP and the camera operator and the dolly operator and the grip and, you know, and all kinds of people in the office. And we had a terrific uh, birthday Zoom call with Chris and he's looking great, doing really well. Nice. That's great. Uh, so here, Lori's saying racing awareness. That's that's what you're you're about. There you go. That's see, I knew that would. <laughs> that, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know. Thank you, Lori. I yeah. hope everybody sure. does. You know, don't you never stop. Uh, you you can stop somebody saying, oh, "Don't say that." Mm -hmm. You don't have to say that. That's right. Yep. You know, that's not very kind. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Call people on it. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Come on. You know, I love it when they talk to... my shit. <laughs> don't get hurt. <laughs> Call me on the shit, please. I don't want to be an asshole. <laughs> yeah, we got those Americans too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh no, I've been pretty lucky, uh, Grace, and I want to thank you again for having me on the show. And uh I think it's uh you're great, you're uh, you're abroad. And oh, uh God. my big dick energy. My big dick energy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if I call broad a big dick energy, but I, I like broads. I like uh, women that have uh, a wide horizon. Thank and you. And they're not just limited to some kind of uh, politically correct way to go in their life. Oh, please. But, but yeah, I mean, you know, we're we're lucky we're in a business where you can do stuff like that. Absolutely. You know, a lot of people aren't lucky. They're in an environment where that's most important. They can't do so, it, yeah. We're all, we've all made choices in our life, but uh, we all get one vote. That's right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, follow Bill Smitrovich everywhere. Facebook, IG. What are your handles for IG? You have like three accounts. Oh, uh, IG is uh, Smitty in LA or right. Smitty Smitro. And um, Twitter is just at Bill Smitrovich, I think. I need Twitter followers. I got come. On, I only got two hundred or something. Yeah, come on, follow me. I have so much more, and I. Uh, but uh, I've been. Uh, I get a kick out of Facebook. I uh, I like uh, talking to people on there, and uh, mm -hmm. I I don't mind people saying what's on their mind, and uh, I let them go mm -hmm. until they reach a point of like ridiculousness. If they do, uh -huh. and then I call them on it, or my followers just bury them. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, they will put up that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And this summarizes everything. This warmed my heart. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Oh, Lori. Thank you, I'm Lori. <laughs> thank you, Lori. All right. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I love you and appreciate you and admire you. And thank, thank, you. thank you. All thank right. You very much. Thank you. And thank you guys for tuning in, everybody, uh, and for your beautiful comments. And I mean, Thank you. Thank you so much. And any I, other questions? Yeah. Any, any other, other questions people have on <laughs> Facebook? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. All right. Bye, guys.